Let's go, Daddy O. Okay. Like I'm surrounded by all my Sunny albums. Uh, was there music in your household when you were a kid? Uh, yes, there was always music in my household when I was a kid. But I don't remember anything specifically. My dad liked 50s music. Um, I was born in 62. He liked, um, uh, you know, uh, doo-wop and stuff like that, and jazz and blues, but nothing specific. What were the jazz recordings that first came into your consciousness? You know, that, uh, to be honest with you, oh, the, the album that I actually have them, Wes Montgomery. Wow. Yeah, so, he, but, and by the way, ironically, he listened to mostly his 50s music, but the Wes Montgomery stuff that he had were the CTI years, you know, the later real commercial stuff. Whereas now, what I primarily listen to is the earlier stuff, the Riverside stuff. And yeah. when, when did you first get turned on to Sonny Rollins? Well, th truthfully, I believe it was a Memorex commercial uh, I, I, where he was playing out on the bridge. Right. Okay. That's the first time, and I took great notice. Who's that? That's really cool. In 1959, after 12 years of success, a great jazz saxophonist decided he wasn't good enough. Sonny Rollins dropped out of the music business. Night after night, he stood alone on the Brooklyn Bridge and practiced. For months, he blew his music to the stars. And when he felt the time was right, Sonny Rollins came back to his public. Since then, his records have earned the highest acclaim. And today, Sonny Rollins is, at last, good enough. Uh, the first album that I got of his, a CD, was Way Out West. And it was with, it was combined with, hold on a second here. The, um, is it, here is it behind me. Oh, here it is. It was, a, it was a CD, and it was this album and Way Out West together on one CD. Um, and I really dug Way Out West. And then from there, I just kept on buying everything I could on CD. And then um, past 10 years or so, I've been very much into vinyl. And so I have at least a dozen of his albums. What is it about Sonny's playing that, that gets to you? <clears throat> Well, tone for sure, but I think more than anything, Sonny Rollins' rhythm. Uh, my favorite Sonny Rollins song is actually with, without a song. And the rhythm of that gets me every single time, just pulls me in. So I think, it, I mean, everything, it's all encompassing with Sonny, but the rhythm. What jazz do you listen to today besides Sonny? Oh, I listen to, uh, well, I have a thing for the, the big sounding, like Ben Webster. I love, love Ben Webster. Um, I love uh, Coltrane. I love Miles Davis. I love Monk. Um, I love Bill Evans. I mean, I listen to anything that's great. I listen to classic jazz. I also listen to classic rock and roll, blues. I love John Lee Hooker. Um, I love Buddy Guy. So, I mean, I have a wide range, but primarily, I mean, jazz is my thing. Second, when did you develop an interest in comedy, Jeff? In kindergarten, I guess. Nursery school. No, not kindergarten. Nursery school. Uh, I discovered that I made the other kids laugh, and that made me feel good, and I never stopped from nursery school on. When I was eight years old, my parents took me downtown Chicago to see uh, Jimmy Durante. Uh, I asked them on the way home if that was a job. They said yes. I said that's the job that I want. The uh, interest in Jack Benny. What was the yeah. catalyst for that? He, Jack Benny, just you know how certain people hit your funny bone. The two people that really hit my funny bone were Jack Benny and Jackie Gleason, and I watched reruns of them. And uh, then with Jack Benny, I started listening to the radio shows. Um, but Jack, and my favorite movie, uh, one of my favorite movies, is To Be or Not To Be. I think that's uh, it's a Lubitsch movie, Ernst, Ernst Lubitsch. Right. And uh, it's, it's really one of my favorites. I love that. 
And a fan of the Honeymooners? Oh, very much so. My gosh. Yes, the classic 39, the Lost episodes, the musical episodes, all of them. I, uh, yes, very much so. Jackie Gleason was a big jazz fan himself. and In fact, he recorded a number of recordings and used the great trumpeter Bobby Hackett. Bobby Hackett with that great sound. My favorite one is the first one, Music for Lovers Only, but I have a bunch of them. But the first one is really such a beautiful album. And it came about where uh, Jackie Gleason was in the movies watching, uh, um, uh, um, oh, my, my brain, uh, Clark Gable seduce a woman by playing music. And he said, if Clark Gable needs music, everybody needs music. And that's what he did, why he did music for Lovers Only. Let's talk about the process of improvisation and comedy. Yes. What is the uh, process by which Second City operated? And you operate as a stand-up in terms of utilizing improv to develop routines. Well, there's two things that I think are really important in terms of the Second City way, which I do, which I use as an actor, which is... You get what you get from the other person to use to, like, explore and heighten whatever they give you. However, the most important thing as an improvisational actor is, and you have to have this in your head, and that is making the other actor look good. If you're trying to make the other actor look good and he's trying to make you look good, guess what? You're going to look good. doesn't always work that way. A lot of people go up on stage, they're selfish. They're not thinking of exploring. They're not thinking of making you look good. And it just doesn't, it's not fun. It doesn't flow. My job is to try and communicate what it is I'm trying to do to the audience. Sometimes they dig it, sometimes they don't. It's not my responsibility to make them dig it. I, I, I'm not selfish. I want them to dig it. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that they dig it. But sometimes they don't, and that's okay, that happens. Now what I'll do, uh, like uh, where I'm inspired from Sonny Rollins, is that I will take a piece that I've done before and do it in a completely different way and add things. But I also go up on stage with ideas, just free-floating ideas, and I go off on them. That's how I write. I write on stage with just something that I think might be funny, talk about it, and it develops into something. Once it develops into something, then I play around with it. And I make it really big, and then I'll bring it back, and then I'll, yeah, it'll grow. And it's a constant process, but it's always interesting to me. Well, what you're talking about is also the way that musicians improvise. Right. Well, that's why... My greatest influence as a stand-up comedian is really uh, jazz music. And, and I can honestly say that I'm trying to think of anybody else. Maybe Louis C.K., I'll have to ask him if he feels the same way I do as far as that's concerned. But I might be the only, you know, a lot, not a lot of my peers improvise. Um, and sometimes I think uh, maybe I'd be at Carnegie Hall if I didn't improvise, where I just did the thing and every night there was a consistency, um, who knows? Uh, I, I, but I am an improvisational stand-up, and it is uh, completely influenced from improvisational jazz. Now, in terms of improvising within a group, which is what musicians do, on Curb, you worked with a basic script and then yeah. improvised as well. Could you talk to us about that process? Sure. Sure, that process is... The, the script is normally a script for a uh, television show, uh, like a half-hour television show, a single camera, um, 35, 40 pages with no commercials like we have on HBO. Ours are seven to eight pages. So all the dialogue is improvised. So every take we improvise, at least I know I do, different dialogue. And every take I give Larry what he needs. I look at myself as Larry David's storyteller. Like I'm telling the story that he's thought of. I'm not trying to make myself look funny or look great, but I'm trying to make him look good 
and trying to have and trying to tell the story that he wants to. So we'll do a take. Uh, we don't rehearse, zero rehearsal, uh, which is comp also very unusual. And then after we do a take, uh, myself, Larry, the other producers, we stand around and talk about it. And then we do it again. And then we do it however many times until we have it the way we want to. Or at a certain point, we're like, we only need this part to make sense. We have everything else. Um, the fastest scenes are when it's just Larry and I and not other actors. Um, the more actors, the longer it takes. Uh, the more people that aren't as experienced as improvisers, the longer it takes. But with Larry and I, it's just second nature. Now, Jeff, your feature film, Dealing with Idiots, was improvised as well. Could you talk yes. about that process? It was the same thing as, um, as, uh, uh, as Curb Your Enthusiasm, same exact process. It was a full movie. The script was probably maybe around 20 pages. Um, and we'd shoot the scene. Uh, I guess I discussed it a little with different people who were there, uh, and also um, Aaron O'Malley, who was a producer on Curb. Um, she, uh, but it was done the exact same way, all improvised. All improvised with a million actors, a million locations, and I shot it in 12 days. It was, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I did it. Uh, if I had another week, I think it would be a much better movie. But, you know, <clears throat> what I find fascinating about jazz, and I, and I feel the same way about, about um, uh, movies, in terms of when, a, when there's a jazz album recorded, it's done in a few sessions, a few days. It's not like... You know, it's amazing the skill it takes to play jazz. Now, I love classic rock, what, ha what have you, the Allman Brothers, you know. I love, but some of the bands today take months to make a, an album, and the skill level is one one hundredth as much as a jazz uh, 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 player uh, playing jazz. And so movies, a lot of times, people like doing a million takes, uh, shooting over long periods. Um, 12 days is kind of insane, uh, but a lot of movies, sometimes they take three, four, six months. I don't get that. Uh, I think that I'm all about performance and energy, and that's why I think jazz albums are great. They're sessions. You go in, you kick it, you're done. Yeah, um, in particular, uh, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, right. he didn't even show the musicians the music in advance of the session. They went in there... And a lot of the tracks on there were the first or second take. And that's the way Miles uh, preferred to work when he recorded. But, but that's the best way. And who's to argue with Miles? Yeah. On the other side of the spectrum, Stanley Kubrick. I mean, uh -huh. he sometimes did hundreds of takes. Well, Stanley Kubrick is an exception to the rule. You know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and who's to say that Stanley Kubrick's would, movies wouldn't be just as great with a half dozen takes. Uh, you know, but Stanley Kubrick was real specific in terms of, he, did, he was specific in his looseness. What I mean by that is, he didn't know what exactly what he wanted, but he knew he'd see, he, he, if he saw it, he'd know that's it. Jeff, you know? Jeff, as an improvising artist, let's go back to Sonny Rollins for a second. One thing yes. about Sonny, his live shows in particular, he, he gets up to play, and he can literally improvise for a couple of hours. As a comedian, drawing the parallel, is it difficult to just keep on improvising continuously for a long period of time? Not for me. That's what I do. And it's actually, I don't want to say easy, because I have respect for my art form, but uh, I'm an improvisational stand-up. My peers, not so much. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to feel like I've excluded anybody or there's somebody new, but it's what I do. I'll go up on stage with nothing. I won't even go up on stage with a preconceived idea. I'll tell another comedian before I walk up, I say, give me a word, give me a thought, and they'll say, light socket. Or I remember, 
I remember uh, a, a friend of mine came to my show. I said, uh, you know, I improvise my sets. He's like, really? I go, yeah, give me, a, uh, give me something. And he gave me the, the orange guy with the crown that's on a bag of oranges. And I did 35 minutes on that guy and how it came about, the meetings that led to it, the approvals. Like I did all the characters and it was great fun. Um, and I don't, it's just what I do. I, speaking of Sonny Rollins, I want to just go to this. Do you know what show I was at? I was at the Carnegie Hall show with Branford Marsalis. Really? Yes. I, I still have the review from the Village uh, Voice. And that, that show, it was in the 80s. I don't remember, I don't remember what exa year exactly. But at that time, Branford was the hot sax player. He was the coming up. He was the young lion. He was it. And so he and Sonny in concert, Carnegie Hall, my God. Now, Branford Marcellus, I'm sure, is a good guy, but Sonny, and it was I don't know what, I can't go into Sonny's mind whether he was going to take him to school or not, or how much he dug the kid, how respectful the kid was to him at the time. I say kid to a man who's now probably in his 50s, but um, uh, Sonny was, I don't even know, I can't even describe how brilliant he was, and great, and the kid looked lost compared to Sonny. The last time he was in town, which was at UCLA, I, um, I'm a good parent, I had to go to parent night at my kid's school, I couldn't go, I, to, I bought tickets, I bought tickets, and uh, I gave them to a jazz pianist that you may have heard of, Larry Golden. So I gave Larry my, he thanks me all the time. I gave him my tickets to Sonny Rollins at UCLA because I went to my kid's school. But, you know, you got your priorities. I mean, that's, I mean, my kids are probably the only thing that can keep me away from Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins, if by some long shot you are seeing me say this to you, happy birthday. And thank you for enriching my life on a deep level, spiritually uh, and also artistically on a personal. Yeah. Sonny Rollins, saxophonist, you have completely influenced Jeff Garland, comedian, in my work. And thank you and happy birthday. And thank you, Jeff, for being such a mensch in doing this interview. Thank you. It was a joy.